Okay, welcome everyone and thank you for your flexibility in scheduling. Um, again, I am Mary Quay. I am the Associate Commissioner for Market Regulation and Professional Licensing here at the MIA. And before we get into any conversation, I wanted to start with a review of the MIA's jurisdiction and give some background on some of the laws involved for commercial insurance. And I am hoping that some of the carriers will be willing to talk a bit about what the normal process is for some of these things. Um, but Maryland law applies to insurance policies and HMO contracts issued in Maryland. And this makes up about 17% of the market. Maryland law does not apply to self-funded employee health benefit plans or to federal plans, including Medicare and the Federal Employee Health Benefit Plan. As we've previously discussed, Medicaid is primarily under the purview of the Maryland Department of Health, but is also subject to federal law. For health plans to which Maryland law does apply, Section 15701 of the insurance article applies to each health insurance policy, contract, or certificate that is delivered in the state. If the policy requires reimbursement for a service that is within the lawful scope of practice of a healthcare provider licensed under the health occupations article, then the insured or other person entitled to reimbursement under the contract is entitled to reimbursement. This would appear to include pharmacists. However, there is nothing to prohibit an arrangement whereby a provider is credentialed and reimbursed through another provider, such as a facility or physician. And that is in fact fairly common for different types of providers. We have heard in prior meetings about the benefits of having the pharmacists provide certain services. If these services are covered by the policy, then it appears that they should be covered when providing, provided by a pharmacist. Again, this could require billing and reimbursement through a facility or physician. If the services are not covered, and insurers do not voluntarily offer them, then the services could be mandated by law. However, mandates do not generally apply to small employer or individual policies. If a new mandate is made applicable to small employer or individual policies, then the state is required to defray the cost under the Affordable Care Act. Mandates also do not apply to policies to which Maryland law does not apply. And we have heard some about codes at our last meeting. CPT codes are defined by the AMA, the American Medical Association, and the AMA and CMS provide guidance on how to use the appropriate codes. Carriers may have their own coding guidelines. There are laws requiring notice to providers of the coding guidelines. Providers have a responsibility to bill for the correct code for the service, and carriers have an obligation to pay a clean claim for a covered service. Carriers may request additional information to verify that the code was appropriate if the carrier has a reasonable basis to think the code was not correct. A list of codes was provided by the pharmacists, but I have heard that carriers have some questions about the list. We can discuss those questions as part of our discussion of coding. As always, please mute yourself when not speaking and raise your hand to speak. So does anyone want to get started with the conversation? Well, I will put, I'll, okay. I'll jump in. 
Hi, everyone. Leah Horton, Maryland Pharmacists Association. So um, I, again, apologize that I had some difficulties getting in on the last call. Um, I did take a quick look at the materials that have been submitted um, for public use for the work group and was honestly disappointed to see that there wasn't any information provided from any of the carriers about what they're doing. Um, they are gonna have more information than us on um, the services that they're providing around the country and a, a bit more access to get those. Um, we've provided what we've been able to collect over time and via that um, CPT code spreadsheet, but um, it would be helpful to get that information from the groups as well so that we can continue to have the conversation. And again, I preface this, I was not at the last meeting, but um, I was hoping that we would have like um, some additional information for us to look at as well, um, because it looks like everything that has been submitted so far that has been made available to the public and to the work group has been submitted from the pharmacy group. So hope to get some more information and um, feedback from the carriers. And uh, that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Well, I see two hands up. Uh, Deb, are you ready? Ready as I'll ever be, thank you. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted, um, we, we've been looking into this since the session ended, um, trying to figure out if there are, why the, the necessity, will it increase access and what would change if the bill passed versus what happens today? And um, we overall pay for services provided. I'm going to try to go through the process. Um, we pay for services that are provided by a pharmacist if it's within their scope of practice, regardless of the setting. However, the setting is the most important element of this conversation. When a pharmacist, and I'm trying to do this in my head so it makes sense to me, so hopefully it'll make sense to everyone else on the call because this is not my forte. And so this is the way I understand it. So if anybody has something that's not, I'm not saying it quite right, please correct me. I'd appreciate that. When a pharmacy comes into network, it's the pharmacy, not the pharmacist that's credentialed. So today, when a pharmacist is providing either dis, uh, dispensing medications or doing some of the, um, the consulting services, um, providing vaccinations, flu shots, it's the pharmacy that bills. That's the easy process. And we've all been able to make adjustments, especially as um, services have expanded for pharmacists, um, reimbursement in the pharmacy, like vaccinations. Now, what this does is says, what happens when a pharmacist who still has the ability under their scope of practice to provide a service, does it outside of the pharmacy? That's where we're having problems. And I'm not prepared to give you my position today. So I wanna start with that because we're still, we've, I can't tell you how many phone calls we've had on this. The problem we're finding is the breakdown is once you're outside of um, the pharmacy because the pharmacist you all know is not credentialed. They're not credentialed when they're in the pharmacy. So when they go, when a pharmacist today wants to provide a service in a clinic, a hospital, long-term care facility, et cetera, et cetera. They still have the ability to perform the service. It is still considered an in-network service. It still will be reimbursed, but they do that under the supervision of a provider, healthcare provider who is credentialed in our network. That's the only way we can um, uh, commit, submit claim, uh, reimbursement is if you are credentialed in our network. So today, these services are happening. They are happening by pharmacists. They are happening outside of the pharmacy, but you have that element of you need that over 
overarching credentialed provider. There's no reason today why that provider can't reimburse the pharmacist for that service. They're part of a team, it's part of a care team. So that's how it happens today. If we break that today, pharmacist is still gonna be able to provide the service. Still, there will be reimbursement, but the difference will be, there's gonna be a lot of hurdles that have to be implemented in order for, the only thing I'm seeing is direct reimbursement. I think that's, when I try to go down this avenue, that's the only thing that's missing is they're not directly being reimbursed because they could still provide the service. So in order to have that direct reimbursement, um, it's not really simple. So what I have found is not, we have to credential all the pharmacists that want to do this. They're going to have to get medical, part of credentialing is having medical malpractice insurance or some sort of malpractice insurance. I'm not really sure how that translates to a pharmacist. Um, we have to create all new benefits. We're going to have to file new contracts. Um, update payment systems and coding systems. We have to update medical policies because right now it doesn't say that a pharmacist can bill for these things or what they can do. Um, so that's why there are so many different pieces that don't exist today that would have to go into place for, and, and Aliyah, I would love um, if you could help me because I'd like to be able to share with my um, team if I'm wrong that the what will the one piece that's missing is that you're not directly reimbursed. So we would have to create all those elements for direct reimbursement. Am I missing something else that happens under this, cha uh, this change? And so, that, so that's sort of how it happens today. And that's what would happen tomorrow. We did check with other um, plans because we don't do this in the states that we um, do have our in our jurisdiction. And they say they're not seeing a lot of take up because the credentialing process is difficult and it's something the pharmacists don't typically do. And there's a lot of pieces to it. You know, again, it's the malpractice, it's everything else. And so this potentially, I question, could be a lot of work. Um, and I'm not sure, and I'd love to know the value proposition because you are able, pharmacists are able to perform those services today. So that's, that's sort of where we are, but we're not getting a real positive sense when we talk to other states. And that could just be who we've spoken to. And again, I'd like to hear a little bit about that because obviously I haven't spoken to the universe. So maybe um, I've been too limited in my conversations. So I just wanted to share what the practice is now and what it would have to be. Thank you. It is helpful to know the current status quo. Um, Matt had his hand up, but I think it's no longer up. Oh, I'll wait so, for a bit, Mary. Huh? I'll, I'll wait for a bit. Okay. That, that covered most of it. Okay. Uh, Kim? Thanks, Mary, um, and good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to take a slight step back from what Deb had to say. I'm not going to dispute anything Deb had to say. I agree very much with what Deb shared, but I'm going to take a step back to paint just a little bit broader picture about why we're having this conversation from the industry perspective. So um, for many, many years now, the way many plans, not every plan, but many plans operate is that we often do use third parties of various sorts to administer certain benefits underneath of a plan. That's not exclusive to pharmacy. There's lots of different service categories where the carrier is choosing not to build their own network, do their own billing, administer those benefits and are leaving it to a company who's chosen to specialize in a particular set of services to handle that. Pharmacy is one of those spaces. And so I'm part of a company that's both a carrier and a PBM. And so there are carriers who don't do their own pharmacy services at all. They're not necessarily directly connected to a PBM. They're contracting with a PBM as a third party. And so the way benefits under a contract that covers both medical and pharmacy benefits occurs is often the administration of those pharmacy benefits is left to that third party, in this case, PBM, who is administering those benefits, handling those claims, often building those networks and doing that adjudication. So you've now got two separate systems, two separate networks, and they've been built based on who traditionally has participated, right? So that PBM network is going to be comprised of pharmacies, as Deb just said, we credential pharmacies. We don't credential the individual pharmacists 
who are working inside of that pharmacy. Um, we leave that to the pharmacy to be responsible for. It's part of their agreement to make sure that their pharmacists are licensed, that they're carrying the appropriate insurances, that their licenses are current, all of those sorts of things. They don't have a disciplinary history. Those are part of the, the broader agreement, but the pharmacy is managing that. And so historically, the primary jurisdiction of pharmacies has been the administration and distribution and dispensing of pharmaceutical drugs. Over recent years, that scope of service has started to evolve. And I think what has been challenging here and across the country has been the policy evolution really happened very quickly without any real consideration for how the industry is set up, the way the systems are set up, and who is responsible for what. So you've got now a pharmacy space that's not designed to handle CPT codes, it handles NCPDP codes, the computer system is designed to adjudicate those sorts of claims. And we have been working to bootstrap together the ability to shift um, certain services that have been included in expanding scopes of service under that umbrella, separate from the medical umbrella. That works sometimes. Sometimes even that becomes challenging for carriers where a particular plan has bifurcated who's providing their, their medical and who's providing their drug benefit. And so they really need to be able to pay for those vaccines under the medical benefit that's in a separate network that's not designed to be administered in a pharmacy um, versus those where maybe the PBM is a little bit more integrated. And if the PBM has now expanded its ability to cover vaccines through its system, that can be done. There are a lot of PBMs now. What we've all done is, like I said, figure out a way to bootstrap together the ability to make the system accommodate things like a flu shot, a COVID vaccine, other um, increased scopes of services. We've had to figure out and work with pharmacists to help them understand how to deal with over-the-counter drugs now that don't need a prescription or being prescribed by the pharmacist. That's now a different set of services that have to be administered through that system. And so, um, Certainly, as scopes of service have, have expanded, we found ways to do that. I think what um, one of the challenges as this bill came forward, and a little bit of, I think, of what became unclear was exactly what the bill was looking to change, I think, almost in anticipation of broader scope of service change. Um, as, as Deb shared, we do have a few states where there is a need now for the pharmacist to get credentialed on the medical panel as the provider individually separate from the pharmacy. That's not having a dramatic uptake. We've had states that have you know, put requirements on carriers that we've got to have them in the network. We've got to get the pharmacist to come into the network. And it's not always actually as um, easy, uh, not because we're making it difficult, but because that's just the nature of the process. It's the same for all providers. Um, because it's different than what they experience in more traditional pharmacy practice. So I think trying to understand what the goal is, what the lift is when it comes to the very expensive administrative costs, both for the provider and for plans who now have to do something that um, could, not entirely clear yet, deviate substantially for what we're doing today, um, because, you know, it's my 11th grade chemistry teacher used to say there's no such thing as a free lunch. Everything has a cost and every system change, um, especially a state by state, is more expensive than one would ever imagine. And, and trying to make sure we understand what's being requested, why it's being requested, how the administration is expected to go, and exactly what we're trying to accomplish. For things that are currently in the scope of practice, I think substantially um, those who are contracted with pharmacies for things that are at least happening through that type of a setting um, have found a way to, to make that happen. Like I said, vaccines is the, the, the biggest, most obvious one, um, that there's been a lot of work to try to hurry up and expand which vaccines and how that's being done. And we've done a lot of building the plane while flying it, especially for instance, as a COVID vaccine came out of nowhere. So it's not always been perfect, but everybody sort of has the vision for why and where that's going to go. I think as, as Deb said, when we start talking about other care settings, if it's a question of direct reimbursement and that individual provider participation, that's where it becomes a very different conversation for how pharmacists have typically experienced their engagement 
um, alongside plans at, at a high level. There's always been the one-off, but at a high level, that's where some of the difference lies. Thank you, Kim. Again, it is helpful to hear the perspectives of the carriers and what the current status quo is. Um, Aaliyah? Aaliyah, you're on mute. Yeah. In, in hearing the, the feedback, um, it kind of seems like the same conversation that we've been having and it hasn't really moved forward. I think we've been pretty clear in the documentation that's been submitted outlines what we're looking for, um, the type of reimbursement, I think you are correct. And the reason why we needed legislation because there are changes that need to be made. Um, those are, they're outlined, um, I think as these uh, opportunities come about across the country. Every time there is a, a significant change, each state learns how to do it a little bit better. So I think we can take some of the challenges that have been had in other states and seek to um, improve the legislation that, that authorizes the, the pharmacist to be paid for those services. So I, my hope is that we can move forward from the same conversation because I think we've been talking about it for a good year and a half about why we believe um, pharmacists should be more engaged in clinical services. There's the data there that shows that the patient outcomes are much better. It actually saves the carriers money um, in the longer run. So I think all the, the data is there as to why. Um, and I think that Maryland has an opportunity to make that change and do this better than other states. Um, yes, there are gonna be challenges, there are barriers. Um, that are in place that I think can be tweaked, but I'm, my hope is that we can seek ways to make this happen versus saying it's hard um, and other states haven't taken it up. Um, they have, but again, there, there are challenges and I think that we can, can do it better. If there are more, I guess the question is, what more specificity, I guess, is needed? Because I feel like we keep getting asked the same questions. We've provided all kinds of, of data and reports and the feedback from the different practice settings of, of how this can, um, having pharmacists more engaged in clinical services in different practice settings will improve patient outcomes. It helps the physicians, it helps other practitioners. Um, the pharmacists are being trained in these areas. This is kind of standard training within the pharmacy uh, PharmD program. So I think it's a matter of figuring out how we can operationalize that. And that's where I think I'd like to see what the, where the creativity is or where the opportunity, if there is a willingness and um, an interest in the carriers wanting to do this. Now, if you don't wanna do it, like I would rather hear that and say no, and we figure something out. But if there is an interest, which I feel like has been expressed in the past of, to make these changes, then what can be done to facilitate the process? I think there has been a general understanding um, from the pharmacy community that, that some level of credentialing is going to be required, that is needed. Um, pharmacists carry the professional liability insurance already. They're covered by their practice setting as well as um, individuals. They're like double covered. Um, so, and like I said, there are other states that the, um, the Excel spreadsheet that I provided with the CPT codes that are being charged in other states that are in use, that's at 60%. There are more states that are using them and we're working as fast as we can to fill that out. But again, you all know better than we do about the internal processes to make that happen. And if there are challenges there, what are the, other challenges besides kind of changing the software systems, we know those have to happen, but what can be done to do it better than the other states? That's what I'd like to really hear about. So thanks. Okay, I will point out some of us have not been involved with these conversations for the last year and a half. Um, so I am trying to learn all of these issues 
uh, where it sometimes seems that I've walked in in the middle of a conversation. So as I understand it, the dispute is over the direct reimbursement of pharmacists for services that are currently covered, um, but reimbursed through a supervising physician, facility, or pharmacy. Correct. And I, the, Magali Rodriguez de Bittner, as well as Nicole Brandt, can speak from the perspectives of different practice settings um, better than I can. So if uh, I think Magali's got her hand raised too after Allison, so um, they can probably share a little bit more. Okay, thank you. Allison? All right, I'll go next. Um, and I have two things to talk about here. One, um, you know, the larger question is here, how can uh, pharmacists work with um, the patients of carriers in in this way. And for Kaiser Permanente, I would say, um, you know, we have an internal pharmacy uh, network. And so what the way we like to work with clinical pharmacists is through hiring them rather than through um, provider contracting. So um, we do more than 95% of our services through our own internal medical group. And so for those of you who may be interested in, in seeing Kaiser patients, that would be the best mechanism to do that. I did check uh, yesterday and we do have positions open for clinical pharmacists in this region. So spread the word within your networks um, for anyone who might wanna come work with us. Um, the second thing to respond to something that Aaliyah had said, you know, one point of confusion for me all along has been, and I, well, I mean, I think that this is the confusion of the whole group is just what, what would be needed in state law to make this happen. A lot in, um, in our last meeting, there was a lot of talk about Medicare and, I, you know, I was just kind of scratching my head, uh, you know, this group doesn't have any regulatory authority over Medicare. So I think as like a threshold issue, we need to figure out, is this purely an operational thing or is there a change to the law that's needed? I don't know that there's a change to the law, but wanted to see if anyone has a, a definitive answer on that, on that part. If I could just jump in there, um, part of that, the need for the legislation was that whenever we had um, specific scope of practice changes, we had to put in language to say that the pharmacist would be paid for those services. Otherwise they weren't getting paid. Um, so this, the effort for this legislation is to ensure that across the board, if pharmacists are doing services within their scope of practice, that they get paid for it. I mean, it, it's, it's really that straightforward. Now, trying to get down to the specific language of how that could be written appropriately, I, that was my hope of what this conversation, um, this work group was going to be about. But that's, that's really what it is. If, if it was not the case, then whenever we do have had scope changes, we wouldn't have had to add that separate piece of language in there to ensure that the pharmacists get paid. So this is really trying to ensure that um, pharmacists aren't continuing to do work for free um, and are able to expand um, services and really be reimbursed for, for the work that they're doing. But I will um, step away and Golly's got her hand up. Yes, Magali. Hi, Mary, and hi, all. Um, I think I'm, I'm trying to unpack many of the things that I heard and clear some clarification for some of the points. Um, I think that Ali is right, that what we're looking for in this legislation is really recognizing that there's a cohort of healthcare providers, pharmacists, that under the scope of practice within the state and their education, are able trained to provide a series of clinical services for patients that have proven with all the evidence we provided you that improves care of individuals and decrease unnecessary healthcare costs. So what we're trying to do 
In the past, yes, the question is, could a health plan decide, let's say care first could decide this moment that they would include pharmacies as providers, decides that we go through the same process that they've articulated, we're not asking for anything special, you know, pro become providers and care first could today decide that medication therapy management, blood pressure management by a pharmacist, cholesterol by a pharma management by a pharmacist is covered for all health uh, care first beneficiaries and start a process and pay the pharmacist directly. That could happen. What we're seeing in many of the states and what has given birth to this legislation in 10 or 12 states is that in spite of the pharmacists having the ability, the training, the evidence, we're not seeing that the carriers themselves, even when we talk to them, provide evidence, are doing that. So in many states, the legislation was trying to create parity in terms of payment to healthcare providers that under the scope of law and the training are able to provide services that are currently covered by the health plans. So right now, if I am, I'm a care first uh, beneficiary, I go to somebody that does diabetes management, blood pressure management, you know, mo monitors my medications, those individuals will get paid, all right, to provide that, but a pharmacist cannot because they are not providers. They are not uh, incorporated as providers. So that is the, 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 the biggest issue here, that the law was trying to say, okay, Carrier, you already covered that. Pharmacists have the training, the capability. We're asking you to then include them as part of your provider network with the processes that you have in place. One big clarification that I wanna make sure goes on record. We are not talking about pharmacy services from the drug perspective, prescription, vaccines is not what we're talking about since vaccines and all of those things right now have been carved under the prescription benefit. We're not talking about the prescription side. We're talking about the medical side, the clinical side. And that is the discussion at hand because there is where we see a discrepancy. So as such, a PBM is not where we want to go. PBMs are purely about the product, the process. Now they may be paying for vaccinations. So that's not the route. We're talking about the support of a patient receiving clinical services from a pharmacist managing their medications, working with their blood pressure, working with their diabetes, working with their pain management, as a provider, not on their location or a pharmacy. The question keeps asking, okay, if I'm working with Dr. Smith, Dr. Smith is a provider on their care first, on their uh, Medicaid, can he bill on behalf of me because he's supervising me? So the question is, probably he could. The issue becomes that the level of billing that they do, even if the service is equal, is not the same. So it's at a lower rate. So now Dr. Smith says, well, you know, I'm billing, but I'm not getting the amount of dollars for the effort that you're putting into that. So I cannot have you working with me and doing this because I can't provide you the appropriate reimbursement or compensation because I'm not getting that. So it's a, it's a, it's a actually inequalities when a capable person is providing it with the same training blessed by that provider, but they cannot bill at the same rate. Um, I do know that there is differences. If it's a PA, a physician, a nurse, there may be a percentage that, you know, they're allowed to build, but it's at a, at a higher level than a pharmacist. Services are built under a provider. So I just wanted to kind of clarify that, that again, please, we need to detach from the prescription side because this has nothing to do with the pharmacy services. Is the, is the pharmacist as a healthcare provider providing those clinical services that again 
Um, we do know that they improve care, um, and uh, we, we really feel in a way that we are depriving our citizens in Maryland for receiving those benefits that have proven to be effective because we don't have a mechanism to allow the pharmacists to become providers of these services under the existing health plans. And yes, Allison, we need to also put aside closed networks like Kaiser because you have your own systems. The Veterans Administration has their own system. I, I work at the VA for 29 years and within the VA, I am a prescriber. I had same clinical privileges as a physician. I will prescribe, change medications. I have my own panel of patients, but it's a closed system. So what we're trying to do is what do we do in the outside world where most of our patients are receiving care, all right? Where do we do in the, in the patients that go to a clinic, to a clinical setting, or a physician office in a primary care, or outside the walls of a pharmacy, a long-term care? So that's what we're trying to find a path in collaboration with the plans to get there. And that's what we need to know. What do we need to do? What are the process? If you already cover diabetes management and we can provide similar services to other healthcare providers, what can we do so we become also eligible providers? If you're covering cholesterol management, you know, what can we do? Because we also have the ability to do that. So it's those services that you already provide that we have the scope of practice and the expertise to provide. What can we do so we are also allowed to provide those and bill for? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I do want to reiterate that when we're talking about commercial insurance that's subject to the insurance article, there are various definitions of healthcare provider in the insurance article, and we do believe that pharmacists are included in many of those definitions. Um, it depends on the exact wording that's used, uh, but I, I don't think that we can say that pharmacists are not part of the definition. And I can also speak from my experience in handling consumer complaints in my prior position that every so often we would get one where there is a crossover between medical and pharmacy services. And while no one would dispute that the services were covered, it could be difficult to untangle how the claims should be submitted and processed because the different terms of the contract may direct some services to be through the pharmacy benefits versus the medical benefits. Um, but anyway, Deb, I think you have your hand up first on my screen. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to react to a couple things. I just listened and I'm a little bit more confused than I ever was. And we, to my knowledge, we are reimbursing for services that are within your scope that you, once, once regs are done through the health department, it says how you can um, perform services like um, prescribing for birth control, which was something that was not done until a law passed. It's within your scope of practice. You have to go through the requirements in the reg, get certified. Similar for doing, um, um, Ali, if you could help me, what, uh, the different vaccinations that we did uh, that you want to do other types of um, uh, drug. The long acting um, injectables. Exactly. So there's, there's a requirement to go through a regulatory process so that you guys are considered uh, um, able to give those. Once that happens, we have to pay. It's under the law that you, the, the insurance code specifically says if it's in one, someone's scope of practice, you have to pay for the service. That shouldn't be a question to my understanding. The question then is we are paying, we should be paying for those in the pharmacy because that's where you have your contract with us in the pharmacy. So when those things happen and if you choose to do counseling, diabetes counseling um, at the pharmacy and you can bill for that, you'll be reimbursed, right? 
So um, I, I still am totally struggling if that can happen. Now, when we take that to, and you can still do those things outside of the pharmacy setting, you're still gonna be reimbursed the same amount. I can't figure out how it's gonna be different. So whatever you were being reimbursed in the pharmacy, based on your, um, your licensure, we figure out a co how much we're going to pay and that's in your contract. What we do is when uh, scope of practice has expanded for pharmacists, we enter into contracts with an amount. That's still going to be the same outside. So when you think that you're going to be paid more, I don't think that's what's going to happen. It's going to be whatever you what you're paying now. It's that's not. I don't understand how you think you and maybe I'm interpreting what you said wrong, but there's not going to be a different rate if you do this in a facility or in a hospital. Um, and I still go back to someone needs to explain to me whether or not you are there's no reimbursement for those services when they are being performed um, by a pharmacist in those settings through the physician. And if it is through the physician, then it's part of a contract you have with that physician to get reimbursed. So to me, um, it comes down to the, all the different pieces, the building blocks that have to be put into place to change a payment mechanism, not how, not the fact that you can't do those things. So it's not impacting access, I don't believe, because access can be expanded today. You can provide good quality of care. No one's questioning that. It's the reimbursement mechanism. And I, one of the, I just was looking up in the emails and one of the states that we reached out to said that this law was implemented back in 2017. That's when the code change happened. And they're still having discussions with pharmacists because they aren't doing what has to be done for the credentialing. It's still a hurdle. It's still pro a problem. And it's not like they have to be credentialed differently than any other provider. They're just not used to it. But, you know, we're in 2022 and this was in 2017. So this is not an easy thing. And we're not trying to put walls up to stop it because if it's within your scope, we should be paying. We're not disagreeing that it, you, you provide good quality services as to whether or not we should be changing the law to have to go through all the hurdles that have to be created on you and on us to change the flow of money, as opposed to going to a provider, we go to the pharmacist, we arguably, and tell me where this is wrong. Today it's going from us to a provider. You're part of the care team and you can get part of that. So, um, but no one's saying you shouldn't have the ability to perform these services, these valuable services. Um, the other thing I just wanted to bring up real quickly is I've gone through your chart and I am completely confused. To me, I know you're putting it together and you're trying to help, but I can't figure out if this is all Medicaid because when I looked at the what it says it, and not anything, it, does this also apply to commercial carriers? I have no idea. And it looks like there's hundreds of codes but only certain ones have an X next to them. Does that mean those are the, even though you have the ability to perform all those services? Are you only getting paid for those small number of where there are X's? And I think um, it was written that this is just a subset and the spreadsheet was only 60% complete. So I don't even know what the universe is and I don't know what you're looking to be paid for. Is it every code on there or is it just the X's? And what are the states requiring? And again, these look like they were Medicaid. So I'm really confused, but I did look at it. We are now at quarter of, so I will ask, I see three hands up, If, but if you can keep an eye on the clock. Matt? Thanks, Mary. I wanna make sure I did the unmute thing. Um, I think I'd sort of have a question, comment, maybe clarification. So um, Aliyah sort of alluded to it being a year and a half conversation. And I will say the first time I talked about this was with Ali at the end of December or January. So I guess I missed an eight month period of time uh, where there was conversations before me. So I might've missed something. But when I was first presented with sort of the quote unquote challenge, it was in the Medicaid space. And that was that the health department was not paying for services. 
And then throughout session, we became further, further confused when the commercial carriers were brought in. And I'm still sort of trying to figure out how to navigate my own confusion. And I think some of my, my colleagues as well. But um, in 15701 of the insurance article, it requires carriers to pay pharmacies, pharmacists for services within their scope of practice, right? So what we're trying to do is a bar identify the barriers to obtaining that reimbursement. And I am still not sure what that is. Um, I appreciate the, the chart, but like Deb said, the, the codes for me are also were really confusing. And I didn't even know how to sort of dig through. And what I could really use is a couple of concrete examples of what, um, where the problem is and how we might be able to solve it. I don't think that anybody on the carrier community is um, trying to resist paying pharmacists for helping out consumers. That's not it. We just can't figure out what the challenge is. And I think Deb said it in one way, but I was thinking about another one. Why would we pay pharmacists as a carrier more for a, for a service than we do in the pharmacy setting? If pharmacists are doing like medication management in the pharmacy, they get a rate. That rate's going to be the same no matter where they practice. They won't get a higher rate if they practice in a clinic or not. So to me, I'm not sure what can't be done today that could be done if the law passed that was introduced this past year. To, to me, it's just direct direct reimbursement. So I, I, we're all certainly willing to hear more, but we could really use some concrete examples of the challenges that exist in Maryland today, especially in the commercial market, if it is separate from the origination of this conversation for all, I think for the carrier community was that we're not getting paid in Medicaid. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think there's anybody from MDH here today that can address that, but um, thank you for the ongoing work. I just, we would really like to get some more clarity that I think we've asked for a couple of times. So I'll, I'll shut up now. I know we have a clock issue. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm sure we will circle back to Medicaid for what I hope will be our last meeting in September. Uh, Kim? Uh, and, and Mary, because of the interest of time, just because I'm I'm on the carrier side, and you just heard from Deb and from Matt, I'm going to uh, I'll defer. I'll keep my hand up if there's time, but I, I want to make sure that Aaliyah has an opportunity to speak. I don't want to run out the clock. Thank you, Aaliyah. I will go quickly so that Christine has an opportunity to talk as well. I will say one: um, the contraceptive prescribing and some other areas have been mentioned. We are still when pharmacists submit for billing, even for the contraceptive prescribing, which for Maryland was, I think, 2018, pharmacists are still getting denied. So that's something we're still trying to get clarification on. This is from private carriers um, are getting denied for those services. Um, the chart, I, will, I was trying to make sure that we had that in time for that meeting. I will get additional clarification on Medicaid versus commercial. But that chart, my understanding is a list of CPT codes that in some capacity, pharmacists are able to um, bill. The states where we had the information on, we put an X for where they are able to bill and have billed um, successfully in those areas. Um, the, uh, what was the other one? I'll leave it at that. I had some other notes and I can't read my handwriting, but. Um, I will leave it at that and try to provide some additional clarification, but it is for the, again, for the, um, the direct billing and we do need clarification because pharmacists also have billed under the other CPT codes. You're saying that if it's in their scope of fact practice, commercial carriers are supposed to pay, pharmacists are being denied. They're getting denials for those services. So that's the, the information that we have. And so we're trying to, to, to fix that. I will leave it at that and follow up in other communications after the meeting. Okay. And I will say if you are get if a pharmacist is getting denied claims, that those could be appealed and complaints filed with the MIA so we can figure out why. Um, it could be self-funded plans or other plans that are not subject to Maryland law. Okay, uh, Christine. Yeah, so I own professional pharmacy and I have two collaborative practice agreements in the state of Maryland with provider practices. So I know that I am unable to bill unless I am billing under them. So I do anti 
I'm sorry. I was doing anticoagulation pre-COVID. I was going to the office. I was integrated into the practice and I was unable to bill under Christine Lee Wilson as a provider to Medicaid patients in that office. The other piece of that is they wanted to send transitions of care patients to me so that I could help decrease hospitalizations. And we weren't able to do that because I'm unable to provide, again, as Christine Lee Wilson, PharmD, in that provider's office. So those two items are under my scope of practice. The provider is giving me access to those patients to help with services, and I'm unable to get paid for those services. So those are the types of examples in which pharmacists in the state of Maryland want to get paid and are unable to do that. And this would be billing directly as a provider, not through the physician or? Correct. Okay. Yes, I would like, they want me to bill directly as a provider so they do not have to give a piece of their reimbursement over to me. They want me to bill as a provider. Okay. All right, Kim. Um, so just a, a couple of things really quickly, you know, I, I do think one of the most challenging parts of this in all things provider reimbursement is always, um, again, I know it's been said before, but even in some subsequent conversations that we've had today, I've heard Medicaid and Medicare come up and neither of those are really part of today's discussion because they are neither program is within the scope of the Maryland Insurance Administration and Medicare is not within the scope of the state of Maryland, period, right? So I do think that there's a challenge in that um, sometimes what happens is where the challenge has occurred is places that's not going to be affected by any legislative change that the state of Maryland can make. Nothing that we agree to today, any other day, or any bill that the state passes is going to um, do that. And I see somebody saying we're clear about that, except I just heard it given as an example. So I'm not sure we're clear about it when, a comment that I was denied for a Medicare claim was made because that's not within the scope, right? So I, I do think that the narrowness of what is in Maryland's reach is, is not always clear. It's not always clear from claim to claim. I will also share, and, and, I, and I also got the same comment earlier about we're putting aside PBMs, but I also wanna just make clear that often for health plans, management of medication, management of medication related services are not being handled directly by that carrier. They too are often being provided by the third party PBM. So that diabetes management might be fully happening under that separate system. So again, this is just to say it is not as clear cut. This is not to say there can't be a solution. I mean, there is a solution. I think it's everybody understanding the different spaces those solutions are going to come from. Um, what I've not also heard it has been what pharmacist experience has been applying for, you know, credentialing through the state's uniform credentialing form and CAQH to get on a carrier's provider panel. Are we denying you access when you've applied to be credentialed through CAQH? That's how one gets on a provider panel in the state of Maryland um, when it comes to, you know, health carriers trying to get my hands around it. And so I'm going to go back and have a conversation with my lead person for medical credentialing for the state of Maryland again bringing back some of the information that I heard today um, so that when we meet again, I'll hopefully have better information for some of this, but I definitely learned a lot today. So thank you all for that. And I do see comments about being unable to do that. And I, I will note that if there are any concrete examples of that, that would be helpful. And as I said before, if you're having claims denied, uh, that would certainly be helpful if we can get concrete examples through our complaints process here. Because I think we really want to see pharma pharmacists and other providers who are treating patients and providing services paid for those services. And it is unclear whether there is a belief that this cannot happen, so no one is going through the process or if it really cannot happen and people who try to go through the process are receiving denials or 
where the breakdown is happening, because that's the purpose of this group is to identify the barriers. And so it's useful to know that. And I'm aware that there may be separate pharmacy and medical networks. We've heard about diabetes counseling. That is a mandated benefit in Maryland, separate and apart from any pharmacy concerns. Um, so I'm not sure what is happening there because it may be that this, if you're being part of a diabetes management program or diabetes education program, and one of the carriers may tell me I'm using the wrong term for precisely what's mandated, but um, it, that is something that is mandated. And if you're part of that kind of program, the program should be reimbursed for all of the services. So I am hoping that we can have one more meeting to resolve the outstanding issues. That will probably be in late September. Um, I expect Denise, my secretary, will be sending out emails to get any dates and times worked out. Does anyone have any final questions, comments, concerns? Okay, well, thank you. This has been a very interesting discussion and I think it has clarified some issues and my understanding of them to some degree. Um, so thank you all for participating. Thank you, Mary. Have a good evening. Thank you. Okay.